Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we have a very special guest, and I'm so excited to introduce him. He has been on the scene for over 40 years and has worked with so many greats, from Larry Coriel to David Bowie, Randy Brecker, Ramsey Lewis, and for over 20 years, he was an integral part of one of the greatest bands of all time. I'm talking about the Pat Metheny Group. This gentleman is a drummer, educator, composer, and just one cool guy. Please welcome to Jazz Talk, Mr. Paul Wordico. How are you, man? Great, man. Thanks. <laughs> so it's so good to have you. <laughs> I was thrilled. You know, all of a sudden I got your email. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is great. And, you know, I'm honored. And, you know, I think it's like the 24th show. I mean, you've interviewed some of my, my heroes and some of my favorite players. Yeah. The show just took off. You know, the first interview actually I did was years ago with Maurice White of Earth, Wind & Fire. Then I did his brother, Verdine. And uh, since the COVID-19 hit, Paul, uh, something just said, you know what? start start uh, reaching out to people and i interviewed drummer lenny white and he told me he says preston now's a good time to catch people because people are quarantined they're not touring so you know now's a good time but paul again thank you so much for being on the show you know i wanted to start and uh talk to you a little bit about your background and most of us know that you're this fantastic drummer but we don't know too much about your humble beginnings i understand that you are from chicago and uh, just curious how you got involved in music, how you started playing drums, just a little bit about uh, those early years. Sure. It's kind of an interesting story because um, my parents and I, we, when I was about 12, we moved to uh, a northwestern suburb of Chicago called Cary, so Cary, mm -hmm. Illinois. And, you know, um, I was getting into the sixth grade and my mom was like, you know, you should take up an instrument, you know, yeah. just don't take up the drums. And I was always tapping on things, you know, I always loved rhythm, melody and harmony, but there was something about the physicality and just, you know, just playing the instrument. So mm -hmm. I joined a, a grade school band mm -hmm. and I had a really good band director. He was a, actually a saxophone player named Vern Pade. Okay. And, you know, he showed me how to hold the drumsticks and how to read music. And it was funny because, you know, 12 years old isn't that late, but compared to all my peers, they all started when they were in eighth grade, you know, or when they were eight years old. Mm -hmm. So I got in and for some reason, it just made sense to me. Everything, music just made sense. And before I knew it, I was the featured person in the concert band and all that. And then, you know, I didn't have a drum set. I had a practice pad and I had a snare drum. And I would practice on pillows. So one reason I got my technique is because I played on pillows. So, you know, I'm basically self-taught. Now think about wow. that. Okay. And I even hooked up um, a clothes hanger to go around my knee and to go around the snare strainer so I could turn the <laughs> snare on and off when I was playing things. Right. So the first time I sat down at a drum set was a friend of mine who had, been, you know, had the drum set for a year or two. And I was just able to play it. It was really strange. I mean, I was doing all this left-handed roll stuff. And I mean, I had no idea why, I, you know. And so for a graduation present from eighth grade, my mom was working at a place that kind of, um, I guess, made certain products for the Ludwig Drum Company. And so she was able to get a good deal. And my grandmother bought a drum set for me. And so, you know, I would play all day long. I mean, I, you know, thank God for parents that can listen to that. Right, and, right. you know, um, I wanted to go and be uh, a chemist. And so the high school band director auditioned me. And, and I'll tell you more about him because we're dear friends to this day. So, you know, he auditioned me and I, you know, I didn't even really want to go into the band. I was more into sports and all that. Yeah. So I would play the drums. And what I used to do is that I would put a radio, you know, AM radio behind me. You know, we didn't have headphones or click tracks or anything back then. And I would play along with the radio, but I would play free over mm. tracks, but in time. So like, you know, uh, you know, I'd be playing with the Hollies or the Beatles or whatever was on the radio and right. play. And then just kind of like, since I could feel time and I could hear form, I would play inside the rhythms so it was more of an organic way of subdividing because, you know, you have mechanical ways of subdividing where you have, you know, eighth notes, triplets, 16th notes, quintuplets, you know, mm -hmm. triplets. And 
my way was just to go from point A to point B. And as long as I knew where it started and where it ended mm -hmm. and that kept it going before and afterwards, I was cool. So I kind of trained myself to do that. And then I wanted to take drum set lessons. And my mom just said, she said, no. She said, like, just do what you're doing. So, um, you know, um, my band director, Don, Mr. Donald Ehrensberger, he wanted me to audition for the band. And finally I did, but I didn't really, you know, I didn't even prepare for the audition. So the band, the concert band had five chairs in the percussion section. And I, I came in last, I think I came in eighth. Mm. And cause I hadn't, you know, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't prepared at all. And he extended the band to eight chairs and I became the head of the percussion section. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So this band director, I mean, you know, um, he was a trumpet player. So he and he wasn't really jazz based. I mean, you know, he had a he was a great marching band director and everything. But he would let me do he would let me improvise on symphonies and say, I like what you're doing more than, you know, what's written. And he would also take us out like, you know, Cary, Illinois was about, I don't know, maybe a half hour drive from Elgin, Illinois. And there was a place um, that in Elgin, Illinois, that all the famous bands would come through, you know, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Buddy Rich, Stan Kenton, Woody Herman. Wow. And he would take the band to see all, and pay for us. And so we'd literally be sitting there on a break and, and you know, I'm sitting there next to Duke Ellington. He's talking to us. Wow. And, you know, I'm shaking hands with Rufus Speedy Jones or Buddy Rich, you know. And I'll talk about that as a band director. So in so many ways, the reason I play the way I play, and I even dedicated my book, we can talk about my book, but I dedicated my book to, to Donald Ehrensberger because I wouldn't have been interested in doing all this had it not been that someone let me be me. Because yeah. I'm not really the kind of person to imitate people. You know, it's not like I can just you know, hear a voice and, you know, sound like Jimmy Cagney or whoever, you know? Right, right. I, and I, I, same with the drums. I mean, when I play, music makes total sense. I think I've got, you know, perfect pitch. I can hear anything and just, which helps. Mm. And form-wise, all the harmonics and everything, no matter what time signature, it all, it just was, it just all made sense to me. So I was able to do what I wanted to do. So um, later on, you know, I was the head of the percussion section, like I said, and then in our senior year, we toured around, we played like some of the other um, cities in Illinois. And I remember I had like a double bass kit and I had, you know, a Prince Valiant haircut and stuff. I remember, <laughs> I think it was in Rockville, Illinois, where, you know, Louis Belson came from. I remember oh, wow. going, going into this gymnasium and all the kids were laughing at me because the way I looked. And then I played a solo and I got a standing ovation from all of them. Wow. So then, like, I think the last uh, part of that particular tour, he went to Western Illinois and because I, I wouldn't even know if I was going to go to college or what. I was just, you know, I've never planned on anything. I'm just one right. of those people. So um, I ended up getting a full ride at, at Western Illinois. Mm. And Gary Chafee was the band, uh, the teacher, not the band director. Uh, Lance Strickland was the band director. But Gary Chafee, who became famous later, going to Berkeley and teaching Vinnie Caliuta and, mm -hmm. you know, everybody. You know, he was, he was my teacher. And... You know, I was always driving home every weekend because I had a girlfriend who was like this genius girlfriend. I mean, she was the Val Victoria and everything. We're still friends to this day. But I would uh, drive home every day and, and even do gigs. And then one time, Cannibal Adderley's quintet came to do to play, and they did a clinic. So they did a rhythm section clinic. So it was George Duke, Walter Booker, and Roy McCurdy. Wow. So everybody sat in, including Gary, you know, and everything. It was fine. And I didn't want to sit in. And on the last tune, my buddy goes, oh, come on, go play. So I took the sticks mid-tune out of Roy McCurdy's hands, and I played, and the place went nuts. And I, I talked to Roy McCurdy. I said, man, I just want to go play. He goes, you should. And I quit school the next day. What? Yes. Wow. Yes. And I moved back to Chicago. I went to a community college, but then I started touring. Mm. And the other thing, you know, is that, that I was so obsessed with drums. I mean, my, my girlfriend used to tell me sometimes I'd be driving and hear a rhythm. I'd just pull off the side of road and write it down, <laughs> you know. So I had all of the drum books. I bought records. I mean, I was obsessed with not just, you know, rock 
but jazz and also ethnic music. So, you know, I'd be listening to, you know, Buddhist monks and then listening to John Coltrane, then listening to, you know, Frank Zappa or Jimi Hendrix. Wow. So the, I never divided those particular genres. I mean, you know, I, I and then I would do re research to where all that stuff came from. And, you know, mm. since I'm, I'm associate professor, you know, of jazz, but I also teach, I've got a class called Exploring the Blues. I've got one now that I just came up with called The Power of Black African Music, Black, wow. Black, Black American Music, sorry. I just came, I came up with Social Justice Through Sound, um, Rock Music, Its Impact, Its Role in Society. I came up with all these, these different things to teach people not only what the music is, but where it comes from culturally, because that's yeah. what I was always interested in. I mean, it's, it's not a vacuum. I mean, you can go to school and learn, you know, technique and you can learn theory, but that's something different than experience the reason you play and the feeling you play with other people that are coming from, you know, uh, the music part of it as opposed to the theoretical, you know, scholastic part of it. So you I know, try to teach kids that. That's incredible. Paul, let me ask you this. Uh, what drummers were you listening to at that time? I mean, you're look, talking about, I guess, what, the, the 60s or mid-60s. Yeah. Who, who influenced you? Who were you listening to at that time? Well, kind of, I mean, I hate to say it, like a lot of people. Um, I guess my first start where I really wanted to play the drums even before I had a drum set, you know, I remember hearing Sandy Nelson, you know, who was this drummer, you know, on the radio one time, just, you know, we were having lunch in some cafe and then my mom and i were driving and buddy rich came mm. on the radio playing wow. you know uptight you know stevie wonder's tune but since i was listening to and buying so many records you know i was you know i got the joe jones the drums record from france you yeah. know i was listening to everyone from baby dodds you know zooty singleton all the way to, you know, obviously, um, you know, Han Benick, you know, like the avant-garde drummers, you know, Milford yeah. Graves, Andrew Cyril. Yeah. Roy Haynes was probably my biggest influence um, in a lot of ways. But I was also lucky because when I was 15, I used to take the train into Chicago and go to Rose Records, which was the big record store. So, and, and I would go to the second floor because everything was a buyout. You know, everything was like 23 cents and stuff. So I would just buy whatever looked interesting. I remember getting Idris Mohammed's Black Rhythm Revolution, just buying things like that and then taking them home and learning the music and learning about them. But also one, uh, one time I went to Marina City which is downtown, the famous, you know, double building. And there was a jam session that had Barrett Deems, the great drummer, Barrett Deems, who was Louis Armstrong's drummer. Uh, you know, I mean, he was the world's fastest drummer. Mm. He was always billed as that. I mean, he took over, you know, with, um, he took over Gene Krupa's thing, but he also, you know, played with Benny Goodman, Joe Marsala. And I sat in with him and he kind of took me, took me in his, under his study, which yeah. was amazing. He didn't give me lessons, but you know, he would he would have me sub on gigs. So I'm playing with Duke Groner, like a bass player played with Duke Ellington. I'm playing with all these older guys. I'm like, you know, a kid. I don't even know how I got into some of these clubs, but I started playing with all these guys that were, you know, legendary that played with Louis Armstrong. I mean, if you go look at the film White Christmas and there's Barry Deems playing, you know, that's him playing behind Bing Crosby, you know. And so I just kind of lucked out in life, I guess. I mean, in a lot of ways. And I always tell kids, I mean, you just have to kind of follow your muse. And then, the, you know, there's going to be forks in the road and hopefully you take the ones that are going to lead to better ones that are going to lead to more better ones. Mm -hmm. And I, that's the sort of way I, I feel really blessed to be able to have done this. That's incredible, man. What a background. Now, you're blessed also coming out of Chicago. So many uh, incredible musicians have come out of Chicago. I can name probably a, a zillion of them. But late 60s, going into the early 70s, of course, you know, James Brown was happening, Sly Stone, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, you had Miles Davis with Bitches Brew. Uh, how did that music uh, affect you? Well, I mean, I remember hearing that uh, Jimi Hendrix I experienced the first time. I was like, I think, 14 or something. Yeah, because they would have come out in 67, so I was 14. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went with a different girlfriend before the girlfriend I was talking about. And we went to some party and it was in a, some guy's garage and he put on the Jimi Hendrix record. And I just stuck my head 
in the in the phonograph for the entire time flipped it over went out and bought it the second day i mean my girl i didn't even see my girlfriend for the rest of that night i was so obsessed you know mm. and so i got a chance to see henrix you know uh 1968 really? yeah wow yeah and so you know i became friends with a lot of those guys too that's the other thing that you know as you get older you end up meeting a lot of your heroes and a lot of times you end up as friends but so like i was saying you know i was listening to you know the other thing about buying records i mean i go to this store called goldblatt's and they'd have a run on mono atlantic records so i remember mm -hmm. one time i bought charles lloyd's love in coltrane on uh coltrane jazz Ornette on tenor, you know, I just bought these records and I'd just play them and I'd learn them. And I used to practice about eight to 15 hours a day. Wow. I mean, yeah, there's a funny story. When I was living in Elgin, I had like this corner little house. And, you know, I'd get home one, two in the morning after a, a gig, you know, it could be summertime, right? And just not even thinking about anything except playing. You know, I'd have the windows open and I'd put on like headphones and jam through the morning, like with, you know, I put on whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. And one time my next door neighbor came over the next day and he goes, man, didn't you hear me knocking on your door at 4.30 in the morning? And I went, <laughs> no. He goes, you're lucky, I was gonna kill you, you know? So it was just like this thing. I mean, where it comes from, I don't know. Cause no one in my family was musical. You know, mm. my mom used to try to sing a little bit like Sarah Vaughan, you know, sometimes. Yeah, I remember her trying to do that. But, you know, there was no nobody in my family, you know. So God knows where this comes from. Yeah. Hey, do you remember your first professional gig, Steve? My first gig? Yeah, I do, yeah. kind of. Um, since, <laughs> this is so funny, let me take a drink of water here. Um, in the old days, on the front of your bass drum, you used to have like the Buddy Rich or Gene Krupa, the little like monogram, looks like a Pennsylvania Railroad thing with, mm -hmm. with your initials in there. So I had PW in there. So my first gig, I played with this organ player who was, you know, I don't remember his name, but we called ourselves the Prisoner of War. <laughs> Prisoner of War. Prisoners okay. of War, yeah, because it fit the PW, you know? And we played at, in Cary, at Harry Hopes, which was this, it was a ski lodge. And we played a gig and, I don't know, we probably made $10 a piece or something, or maybe $10 total. But that kind of led to other things. I mean, you know, I started meeting other people. And mm -hmm. one of the things, it's, it's so funny because, you know, the, the, Mr. Ehrensberg was so great, but, you know, our big band, you know, there was one other player named uh, Harry Spitzer. He was an alto player that was really into jazz. Everybody else was just classical, you know, concert band people. So they, you know, wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. And so Harry and I would jam, just do duo sax and, and, and drum duos in the dark, you know. I remember one time in his, in his basement, his mom all of a sudden walked in and like just, I jumped because I was in this trance. But there was the funniest thing because, you know, there was a bass player whose dad actually was a teacher there and he wasn't really a bass player. And he, we, I have a record of a concert of us. We're playing this John Higgins piece that was like an 11 eight or something and it comes to the bass solo and everyone stops and you hear it he kind of goes do 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 ah he starts screaming you know so luckily i met this guy named mark berenger who's a fantastic bassist he was a even before Jocko, he was, you know, okay. I knew he was playing uh, fretless. So he lived in Crystal Lake, the next town. So he was actually the first great bass player I started playing with. So, you know, you start networking like that and, and things start working out. So um, I guess how I broke into the Chicago scene was really interesting too. Not only with Barrett, but I started playing uh, with Steve Laspina, who is this great bass player that played with Jim Hall. He's, he's still on the East Coast. And this keyboard player named Randy Waldman, who now is like, the, he's like the greatest studio player in LA. I mean, he plays with Barbara Streisand one time, mm -hmm. then he's playing with Josh Groban. He just won a Grammy with Vinnie Caliuta playing this ridiculous stuff that's got everybody on it, like every great jazz musician. So... And then there was a trumpet player named Doug Scharf, who is now, now the trumpet player on the Sven Gulli show. But anyway, Larry, um, Randy and Steve once came to Elgin one time. 
when I was still living in Cary to this guy house. His name was Gordon James. He was a keyboard player. So we we're jamming and, you know, Randy played like Bye Bye Blackbird and just would switch all 12 keys. I mean, the guy is just like off the scale. Right. So afterwards, I, I started talking to Gordon. Now, Gordon was more like sparse. I mean, really kind of musical and sparse. And he goes, well, you know, I want you to meet this other bass player that lives in Elgin. His name's Jeff Check. So I came back the next day and we started playing and I was always into out music. I was always into the sounds of nature and everything. So that's a band. We started calling ourselves the New World uh, Quartet. We had a sax player, but then the New World Trio, which eventually became Earwax Control. Mm -hmm. Now, Earwax Control was like a total free band. Everything was, we never talked about anything. And we would do things. We'd put a television set in front of us on stage that we couldn't see. And people would be laughing because we're playing and it might be Elvis singing or stuff, you know, we would do right, the craziest right. stuff. And, you know, just, we would go out to, a, you know, a house of pancakes and just talk about music till, you know, the break of dawn. <laughs> so I started meeting like minded people. So then Jeff started getting gigs in the city and he would go, I know this drummer and I'd get gigs. I'd say, I know this bass player. So we kind of hopscotched, you know, this is after, this is after I left school. So I started meeting, there was a great trombone player named Bill Porter, who's still alive. He was like the top trombone player in, in town. I started playing with him. And then a sax player named Joe Daly, who was this legendary, not only sax player, but teacher. He taught, you know, John Clemmer, Joe Farrell, you know, I think Dave Sanborn, a bunch of people took lessons. Mm. So I got the gig with him and I started playing, you know, for a couple of years with him. And um, Pat Metheny all of a sudden called me to do a gig because I was also playing with this uh, guitar player, Ross Trout, who was actually a really great guitar player that was Pat's roommate, I think, for the semester or something in Miami. So Pat calls me and asked if I could sub on these this gigs for this week. That happened to be the, the week that Joe, uh, Joe Daly gets a gig at the Jazz Showcase for a week with Muhal Richard Abrams and Steve Laspina. And I turned Pat down. I really? said, man, yeah, I said, man, you know, I've been with Joe for two years. This is like a big gig for us and I can't let him down, you know? And I think Pat always appreciated that loyalty. Mm. You know? And it was funny because that happened to be the coldest weekend of the century up to that point. I mean, it was, you know, it was like the kind of thing I think I took a walk um, to get a piece, to get the paper. And I did this intentionally. It was about a quarter of a mile walk. And my eyelids would freeze every time I'd close them. I'd have to like open them up. I mean, it was just ridiculous. But so, you know, I started playing with everybody in Chicago. The word got around. I mean, there's some really funny, I mean, you want to hear some really funny stories? I, I mean, would love to hear it, yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, okay. Well, like one of the things, like one of the things I broke into, um, there was a band called Street Dancer that was one of the big bands other than Redwood Landing at the time. And um, I was starving in Elgin. You know, I'm living by myself, you know, I'm playing, gigs but like you know basically st starving so jeff check goes man you know this band street dancers playing at harry hopes you want to go see him and i said yeah you know I, I was curious so you know we paid our five dollars or whatever the, the thing was and they played and they were like messing around i mean they were like laughing and goofing around yeah and so jeff goes you know you can stay out you know i'll, I'll meet you out in the parking lot after they're done so they finally finish and I, th there was a sax player named Santez and he goes, okay, uh, everybody, uh, we're going to take a break. And I stood up and I said, thank God, you guys suck so bad. I can't believe it. And I started walking out. So about six months later, I get a call and I recognize the voice because Santez had this low voice. You know, he talked like that. So he's hiring me for a gig. And so we start talking and we're getting along really well. And about a half hour into the, uh, into our conversation, you know, I say, well, Santos, I have to tell you something though, man, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but like when you play Harry hopes, I, you know, I, I told, told you that you guys sucked and he goes, yeah, I know you were right. What? <laughs> yeah. And so, 
for me, music was not something to be messed around with. I mean, you could be, I mean, because earwax control was funny, you know, we, we were sacrilegious in, in a lot of ways, you know, as far as music, we, we did a lot of crazy stuff. But I, you know, with that, they were just messing around because it wasn't a big audience, you know, so I always took it that like, no matter who you're playing for, you can't, you can't like crap on your audience, you know, I mean, th this is like when you play, you got to play. So later on, you know, Santez played, and in some ways, I think that's how I met Ross Trout. I'm trying to remember the chronological order, but in some mm -hmm. ways, that's how I kind of like broke in, Mon met Bunky Green and all these great players through playing with these people. Mm -hmm. But to me, you know, I was always like, you know, music is my life. I mean, you know, it's, you know, it's like Valerie Wilmer, as serious as your life, that book that she wrote, you know, I mean, that's the way I've always looked at it. And it's funny because I'm not a purist, even though I understand pretty much everything as far as, you know, the history of all the different styles of music and stuff. You know, I like to do things my own way. One time I was playing with Joe Daly and, you know, there was a lot of people in the audience and I was always into like manipulating technology. I'm really good with technology even back then. I remember with EOX Control, I recorded Lawrence Welk, Bella Lugosi, a bunch of things on a cassette, cut the tape up so you would have Bella Lugosi and, and, and all that introducing us on stage. So anyway, <laughs> there was a commercial, uh, I forgot what toilet paper commercial, but it went ba da ba ba do ba ba da ba da da. Uh oh. So I'm playing with Joe Daly. We're playing like original music, but also bebop stuff. And I had my cassette player next to me. And so we're trading fours and I hit that. That was my four. And the place went nuts, you know, and Joe just loved it. He thought it was the funniest thing ever. So it was so different because it was, I was looking at it as art. I wasn't looking at it as being anything negative. Now, Joe was tough. I mean, Joe, thank God he liked me because a lot of times after the gig, we were playing till 1, 1.30 in the morning, especially at this club named Orphans. And I'd go to his house afterwards until like dawn. And he would play me all these tapes of, you know, things he had you know freddie hubbard and sonny rollins i mean he knew all these people and mm -hmm. like, so so he was like my mentor as well but i remember one time there was a piano player from milwaukee that he was subbing really good piano player and he had come down to chicago with his friend who was a drummer so we played the first two sets and everything's going really well and on the beginning of the last set, the third set, Joe goes, hey, you know, so-and-so's got a friend. He's a drummer. You mind letting him sit in? I said, no, that's fine. So they play Doxy. And so this is what happened. So it starts, it goes, ba do ba do ba da ba do ba do da da ba da do do da 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 do da Joe stops the tune even before it gets to the melody because it slowed down that much. He looks at the drummer on the mic and says, you ain't making it, baby, and goes like this to me to come back on the stage. Oh, wow. Now, could you imagine that ride home for that drummer? Humiliating. Uh -huh. Humiliating. But see, that's how people were back then. I mean, Joe and Bill Porter, I mean, we almost got into fist fights if he didn't like, I mean, yeah, we would like go, you know, if, if on musical issues, if, you know. Wow. So, you know, nowadays you have to be so, like, you have to be really careful about hurting people's feelings and all those things, which is probably true you know i mean people are, are different but back then man if you didn't cut it you didn't cut it you you went home it's like you know the charlie parker joe jones story you know mm -hmm. when joe throws the symbol at him you know charlie parker went home and he practiced he didn't go home and you know take valium or, or commit suicide or anything i mean right. so a lot of this music is really serious and I, I think in some ways now not for not for students i have great students but in general i mean everything is free now everything is just like it's like one of the things with, with pat Metheny, i remember this was really shocking we were playing i think it was in sweden somewhere in scandinavia and after the show, people invited us to go to some disco for drinks or whatever. So I was like, sure. So we go, and I had never been in anything like this. You know, they had the multi screens and they're playing music and it's just like, it's crazy. And tunes would come on like, you know, Satisfaction. I can't get no Satisfaction by the Stones would come on. And they would play for like maybe 30 seconds and then I would go to another tune. And I was like, what is this? So I asked somebody at work there. I said, why are you only playing like 30 seconds of a two-minute tune he goes 
people can't concentrate that long on, on you know, for two minutes. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, this was in the eighties. So it really kind of goes to show you as things progressed and things got faster, people, you know, they just wanted to keep switching. So now yeah. to be a jazz musician, you know, to sit there and play, you know, a tune for a half hour, you know, I mean, unless you really know what's going on or really interested, it's really hard for people to concentrate on it, let alone on your iPhone. I mean, and this happens to even me probably at some point, you know, you play something and then you, you go, okay, what's next? You know, it's in the old days, you know, you put on a recorder and you let the thing play and then you'd put it on again and you'd play it for your friends and they'd play it again. You know, it was, there was a, a thing about like getting deep into the music as opposed to just using it as wallpaper, which is so sad, I think. You know, Paul, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned uh, Pat Metheny. Uh, Say that again, I, you broke up. Oh yeah, I says in the early 80s, uh, you uh, got with the Pat Metheny group, you hooked up with Pat. How did you guys uh, come together again? Because you went on to have a long association with him. And just some of the greatest, greatest music that I've ever heard that you guys uh, did was just exceptional. But how did you get uh, hooked back up with Pat and I think you and Steve Rodby came in around the same time, didn't you? Steve, Steve came before me. You okay. know. So Steve came in for off ramp. I, you know, well, anyway, you know, I went to see Pat play a couple times. Um, I saw him at Harry Hopes. I saw him at the bottom line uh, in New York and I saw him at uh, College of DuPage mm -hmm. in Illinois. And, you know, I would just go, hi, hi, how you doing, man? You know, great. You sound great. And then leave. It was like, I never tried to hustle that gig. Right, right, right. So we were playing, I was with this band, the Simon and Bard group. And this is like why, you know, my, mar my marriage, we've been together since like 78, wow. no, 76, 76. And, you know, I would go on the road to, you know, and make, you know, 160 bucks a week, you know, sleeping on people's floors. I mean, I could have been in Chicago doing sessions and, you know, making a lot of money, but I wanted to play music. And mm -hmm. the Simon and Bard group kind of started... Um, they hired me and Steve Rodby to do some gigs and I, we played on their first record and then they started touring. So one of the tours, we were in Portland, Oregon and um, Pat's band had played that same night. So Pat and Steve came in after their show and they heard us play. Mm. So it was funny because I just, you know, again, I just said, hey man, you know, I didn't think anything about it. And we played good, Larry Gray, the bass player from Word of Cocaine Gray, who I've been with since 76 too, you know, <laughs> he was on it and stuff. And I remember Fred Simon and Michael Barr were really excited because he, they thought that he, they can't, Pat came to hear the band, but I guess they found out he was coming out to check me out. Mm. And so a couple of weeks or maybe a month later, I get a call from Pat saying, you know, Nana Vasconcelos had left. They were going to audition a new percussionist. And would I be interested in just playing for the audition? So I said, sure. Now, you know, I didn't even, I didn't even listen to a lot of that music, believe it or not. I mean, you know, um, so I went, I flew out to Boston and we played for about, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or a half hour with the percussionist. And then he left and then the four of us played and literally it was like, like maybe, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours. I remember even because it was freezing. It was right, be right around right before Christmas. And, you know, at one point, Pat asked me to leave the room and I'm, I'm, I'm on the hall, like freezing, you know, and I went back in and he kind of gave me some of the gear that he had bought for the percussionist to take home. I thought that was kind of cool. So later on, I get a call from him going, hey, I'm going to be in town. Uh, on New Year's Day, um, want to play as a trio? And I said, sure. So I got together with Steve and Steve kind of hit me up to some of the music and we played, you know, it was fun. Just, you know, just with some hotel, you know, like, um, it was like just some room, in, not a hotel room, but you know, just a place, I think it was in a hotel downtown. And then, you know, a week or two later, maybe even less, but all of a sudden I get a call from Pat going, do you have a passport? And I go, no, he says, get one. You're going to Europe with us. And that's sort of how it happened. That's incredible. You know, and like I said, um, Paul, all the music that you, you guys did together was just incredible. I mean, like I said, I like the early inception of the Pat Metheny group, you know, phase dance, all of that. But my favorite period is from Steel Life Talking 
all the way through Imaginary Day. All that music that you guys made and Pat's stuff with Secret Story, just just beautiful. Um, but uh, you guys just toured everywhere. You guys were all around the world. Uh, I can't even count how many tours that I've seen of you guys. But uh, what was it like playing with that band? Because so much talent. I mean, of course, we just lost Lyle Mays early this year, just a genius. And uh, he was so uh, important to the sound of that band. And, you know, years ago, of course, you guys lost uh, Mark Ledford. But that that group of musicians really solidified the Pat Metheny group. But what was it like playing in that band? Well, it, it changed, you know. I mean, the first tour was, um, you know, I was still trying to learn the music. I think the first gig we played was in Oslo, Norway. And I had never been to Europe, right? Mm. And so I'm still trying to learn the music. And, and Pedro Asnar had yeah. just joined the band, too. So our first gig, we played, uh, I think, Jan Christensen and Jan Garbrecht were in the audience. And we played, and I had brought my drums. Now, the second tune, my snare drum, the snares broke off. So they had to tape the snares on. And we played like a three hour and 45 minute show. I remember that was like unbelievable. Wow. So then Pat would discuss things either after the show for that tour or like the next day, like criticizing and critiquing and all that. So like, you know, he'd point out one thing and that one thing would blossom into learning 10 more things. Just like, again, like the forks in the road. So that tour was really hard because, you know, um, we were the new guys. Um, in some ways, we were really famous. We played, you know, Hammersmith Odeon and, and stuff like that. But we also played some gigs. We played in Le Mans, France, where, you know, there were it was it was winter time. We were all in winter coats inside because we didn't have enough people for the owner to turn on the the heat in the, wow. in the venue. So there was a lot of funny stuff. And then you know things were kind of going okay. And then that tour got extended for a few weeks. And I remember flying from England to Paris on that extension, and we were in first class on that flight. <laughs> and this kind of this kind of tells you about that extension, that part of that tour. Uh, my watch broke. It stopped, but also I was, you know, we're in first class. It's not a long flight from London to Paris. And I put my seat back, you know, this is first class, no problem, right? And this guy behind me, you know, he kind of pushes my, my seat up. And I kind of looked like, you know, oh, you know, what, you know? So I kind of put it back down and he pushed it back up. And then I put it back down. Cause I mean, there's this, it's not like being a coach now. I mean, you had, you right. know, wasn't even close to being in, infringing on his territory. The last time he goes, bam, he just slams me down. So I looked, the guy, you know, the guy was drunk. And, you know, they actually, I think they threw him off the plane. I think, I don't know if they charged him or whatever. But that was the beginning of the, 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 the extension of the tour. So that tour got, you know, we were exhausted. Um, and, and I hope, you know, I'm not sure what Pat thought, but, you know, he would tape every, every night. And... About the sixth gig, uh, sixth gig from the end, I remember Pedro and I would walk around after dinner all the time for hours just talking about the music, you know, because we were, you know, it was, it was so foreign to us. And, you know, at the very end of that gig, we come off and Pat like kicks the garbage can next to the, the stage, you know, he was so pissed. And we're thinking, oh, God, you know, what did we do? So Pedro and I walked around and we get back to the hotel and we could hear the music playing from Pat's room of that night. And then the next day he was really nice to us. And that was like, all of a sudden, I think he realized that what we were doing was actually good, you know, because, you know, things were set in stone in a lot of ways too. And Pat hired me to be myself. He didn't, you know, I mean, there were certain things that Danny Gottlieb played that were part of the arrangement, but he didn't want me to play like Danny. You know, not that he didn't like Danny, but he just, you know, he hired me for me. Right. And um, so when I got home, I didn't know if I was even in the band anymore, you know. And then I got the call that we were going to tour that summer. And then everything kind of got better and better. And then before you know it, the band got bigger and bigger. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, you know, at, like First Circle was the last uh, album. Circle, yeah. yeah, that was the first one for me, but it was the last one on ECM. It was like 84 and, or something like that, wasn't it? It was, yeah, right, 84. And then, you know, we did um, the David Bowie, we did um, 
you know, Falcon, not America. Snowman. Falcon yeah, Falcon Snowman. Yeah, Snowman. And then we did Still Life because now we're at Geffen and Letter From Home. Now we're at Geffen. So all of a sudden, you know, we become like the biggest band f for jazz in the world, you know. So that period was like, fantastic i mean if you can only imagine but the best time for me in a lot of ways i mean the last imaginary day that whole period was great because you know i always thought that i i you know you're always learning on the job but that that imaginary day felt like i really knew what i was doing you know and it was so fun but the most fun was when barb my wife was in the secret story oh so, because, you know, I, I'm a homebody. I mean, that's what, you know, even with this COVID thing, as terrible as it is, I'm happy. I, I'm a homebody anyway, and I can teach <laughs> from home. You know, luckily, my, my daughter can work from home, my wife can work from home, and I can work from home. So, you know, I feel so bad for so many people that don't have that luxury, mm -hmm. but I'm totally happy after touring for all these years, even though, you know, I was supposed to be in Italy. out will talk about the projects, but, you know, I miss going out with my friends and playing, but... I was always a homebody. So when I had my wife with me on the tour, you know, I, we would go, you know, we'd get to Paris. By that time, I was like, okay, Paris, fine. But with her, it's like, yeah, let's go, you know, on the, on the days off and stuff. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. that, was, that was really fun. Just, you know, just to be, because, you know, when you play live, you know, you share looks with people. You know, yeah. you know there, there's a vibe there. And, um, you know, and, and I could just look at her and she could look at me and it was just like, it was like magic, you know? You know, Paul, I wanted to ask you, because one of the biggest shows that you guys did, still to this day, I believe, was that one in 1989 in Montreal. It was like so many people. I mean, I forgot the number that Pat said, but that was one of the largest crowds I think you guys ever performed mm -hmm. uh, for. Uh, but one of the things that I've always enjoyed is your cymbal work. Oh. I love the way that you play. Uh, on uh, certain songs, uh, for instance, like on uh, Letter From Home, uh, Have You Heard? I love that one. And um, uh, First Circle, uh, some other songs, and also uh, In The Heat Of The Day from mm. Imaginary Day. I mean, just, oh, the music was just incredible, man. Always loved your work on it. But um, yeah, that that was definitely my favorite uh, favorite part. Now, what if I may ask, why did you leave the Pat Metheny group in the early 2000s? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I I was kind of done, you know, I, okay. um, you know, my daughter, when she was born, um, the, the band was supposed to go on tour and Pat didn't cancel the tour. Uh. So that was one thing. So like I trained another drummer to play the first part of that tour. And then I met up with him after she was born. I mean, the day she was born on the OJ Simpson a verdict day right? oh, really? but so but i'll remember that day because um the night before you know i bought my wife and i we went got popsicles and stuff because we were taking my my wife in the next day to you know have to give birth and i had two recording sessions that day jingle sessions that were only five minutes away so i dropped my wife off and um i'd say you know i'll, I'll see you bet between the sessions so i go to the first session and i play and um, after it was done, I told the producer, I said, I might not be back. You might want to have a sub handy for this, which is what happened. So I was there for the birth of my daughter because I was not going to go on tour. You know, right. it was like the most magical experience. So that's one thing. And then after my daughter was born, I mean, I remember the first time, you know, she, at night she cried. The first album I played for her was John Coltrane's Ballads. So I'm holding her in front of this fireplace that, that you can see, playing her. And I'll never forget, there was like an Elvin Phil, and she kind of looked like, what was that, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then the second album I ever played for her was Earwax Control, so that explains a lot too, you know? But after those first couple of days, my wife had acclimated. I flew out and, uh, you know, landed in Japan and basically landed and then did that the uh the live we in live japan, night no yeah the live, live in japan 1995 yeah. And yeah so i did that and you know i mean, pat wanted to go in a different direction i wanted to go you know by that time too you know my teaching thing is a really interesting thing too i always taught drums i mean ever since yeah. i was 15 before i could even drive my dad used to take me and i i thought i taught at like three music stores already god knows what i was teaching you know because i only been playing kit for like a year but i had this fan you know i have this natural ability my hands i don't know my feet i'm wired very fast i mean i remember taking a, a test 
the driver's license thing in our school and I had way faster reflexes than anybody else had, you know, they, they check your reflexes. So I'm wired for speed. I actually had to learn how to slow down, I think. But anyway, one of the, one of the things about that was that, um, you know, I wanted to be um, a teacher, but I was always on the road. So I was, the, the way I started teaching even at universities was I did a clinic uh, at, at Lawrence University in, in Appleton, Wisconsin once, and Patsy Dash and Jim Ross, who were, um, they were in the Chicago Symphony, they saw my clinic and they said, they both taught at Northwestern. They said, hey, you ever think of teaching at a university? And I was like, no, but I mean, I'd love to try it. So I got on and I started teaching there, but adjunct because I was always, you know, on the road. So about 2002, I did a clinic at um, Progressive Arts Society for Illinois um, at Roosevelt University. And Ed Harrison, great percussionist, all plays in lyric opera and stuff. He said, man, you should teach here. So I started teaching adjunct there too. So, you know, when you're adjunct, you could teach as many universities as you want because it's all, you know, it's not a full-time position. But then I remember, you know, a couple of years later after leaving Pat's band too, I was getting really busy. I talked to the Dean, uh, uh, Dean Linda Berna, and I said, man, you know, if you ever want me to do more, and she goes, well, what about a full-time position? And I was like, what? You know, I'd never thought about doing that. So I said, I'd be interested in doing that. So uh, she said, well, well, we'll talk about it. So about a year later, um, her, she's the Dean of the Music uh, School at Chicago Car College of Performing Arts and the Dean of Chicago College of Performing Arts, because there's a theater department and music department. Mm -hmm. I met with both of them and they said, well, you'd be interested, you know? And I said, well, yeah. I said, but you know, I want it to be tenure track. And so I got, you know, got the position and then I got tenure, thank God, you know? And so, so I had to quit Northwestern. Once you become full-time at a university, you can't teach at another one because, right. you know, it's just not, it, you know, because somebody might be using your name to, to, to get students to go there. And, you know, if you're full-time at a, another university, they don't want you to do that. But that's sort of how all that happened too. So that's one reason I, I didn't want to go on tour the way doing that anymore. You know, I wanted to be there for my daughter and my wife, especially though, you know, cause you know, I'm, there's a lot of musicians and I can't fault them. You know, everyone's got their own mission in life, but who never see their kids, you know, it's, it's like they have a kid and you know, the kids can turn out fine or not fine. You know, that's just up to, you know, powers that be, but I really wanted to be there. So I never missed a dance of my daughter. You know, I never missed anything important in her life. And mm. we're like buddies. I mean, you know, she's the greatest. So that was another reason I wanted just to kind of move on. Yeah. And again, it wasn't even something, it wasn't something I just sat there and thought about. It's just, it's just, to me, it's just, it's like improvising. When I play, I improvise, you know, it's just, and, and I, hopefully I have enough background to be able to play what is at least appropriate, if not inspiring, you know. I heard you talk about that too. I think in one interview many years ago, I think someone had asked you, what are you thinking about when you're playing? He says, man, I'm just dreaming, you mm -hmm. know, when you're playing. But um, yeah, in regard to, I guess, musicians uh, who tour a lot, you know, and I talked to Pat in December about this just before um, – uh, Lyle passed away and I asked him I says will you ever play with those guys again I brought up some names he says Pat says listen man he says after 30 years I wore Lyle out he said he did not want to tour anymore you know um you know because like I said Pat's on the road and he even talked about living out of a suitcase but um do you enjoy teaching I mean as far as being a professor do you enjoy that more uh, as opposed to going out on the road and touring because you seem like you have a passion for teaching I can see that well, I do. I love it. I mean, I don't know if I love it more. I mean, again, I'm not really one of those people that looks and says, who's the best or who's the worst or what, you know, so I, I love them both. Mm -hmm. And for me, they always build off each other. Yeah. So if I teach, I can help students and inspire students. And, you know, it's like you're the key that unlocks their door, mm -hmm. but then you learn from them, you know, and it's also like when I go on the road, when I go play, I'm able to bring back experiences that help me teach. See, so it's all interconnected. I think that's why sometimes, you know, 
the, one of the dangers in being one dimensional is that like, say if you're a teacher, you know, and you get your degree and then you go teach right away, there's nothing wrong with that. Cause you know, you've got a background, but I think if you're teaching music and especially the kind of music that we're talking about, you really need to have some experience to teach it. Cause it, it isn't just about, you know, I remember t when I was head of jazz at Roosevelt, I did that for five years. Now, then I just, said, okay, I'm just going to teach, you know, but I remember asking like um, Fred Anderson, you know, the great sax player, if mm -hmm. he wanted to do, you know, teach there. And he was like, you can't teach jazz in schools. I mean, he was coming from that, that part of it, you know, because there are some people that think, you know, it's a cultural thing. That's why the classes I teach, and those are a lot of them, those are non-music major classes too. It blows people's minds to really learn where all this stuff comes from, you know, yeah. and I just saw something, you know, I think it was just this morning they had someone had a list of the greatest guitar players to ever live. And for one thing, all of them were white, except for <laughs> Jimi Hendrix and BB King. Now I'm thinking, you know, where's Charlie Christian, you know, where's Wes Montgomery? Where's, you know, and that's Pat Guy, guy. So he loves where, Wes where, Montgomery. you know, where, where's Robert Johnson? I mean, it's right. just like, so like you teach people and, and, you know, a lot of kids don't go far back and it is weird. I mean, you know, if you think about the first record jazz record from 1917, that's when my dad was born, the year my dad was born. That's so far away. That's over a hundred years ago. So even though when I was younger, I went back to baby Dodds and all that stuff, jazz was still only like, you know, maybe 50 years old as opposed mm -hmm. to like what it is now. So right. there's so much more to study and so much to learn. And just culturally, you know, we're, we've changed as far as the way we interact. I mean, you know, I grew up, you know, people sat on their porches and, and talk to each other. Now, like, you know, you don't even know who your neighbors are half the time for most things. And it makes me think about this COVID thing too. You know, the 1918 pandemic, right. you know, you might, some people might've had a radio, some people might've had a Victrola, but in general, what did people do when they were, you know, quarantined for almost two years? Yeah. And here we are, we have the ability to talk to anybody around the world in real time we have more stuff to entertain us yeah than we can shake a stick at and we're crying the blues it's so mm -hmm. weird to me you yeah. know and so to me the, the music um you know represents some of that sometimes so you know there's a lot of great bands there are a lot of great musicians out there but you know sometimes you know sometimes i'll play them uh buddy guy playing in front of uh jimmy hendrix i don't know if you've ever seen that video but it's a live video it's it's very grainy it's not the best looking video but buddy guy's playing and and jimmy hendrix is, is like sitting in the wings there looking and buddy guy breaks a string and they breaks another string so the guitar is completely out of tune and he's playing the notes that aren't even like you know they're not even on any scale they're not even in any key but it's killing you know and jimmy hendrix just has his mouth open like oh my god so it's what you do with with what you have mm -hmm. you know I mean, if, if you look at Roy Haynes, I mean, there's an interview I saw that he talks about, he always wanted to have Buddy Rich kind of chops, but he didn't. So he had to make the most out of what he had. And mm -hmm. then, so he's been playing for seven decades, you know? Yeah. And a lot of it's the same things. I mean, you know, there's that story, there's that, there's a, um, it's a joke, like, you know, Buddy Rich did it and Elvin Jones did it and Ginger Baker did it and Roy Haynes did it and did it and did it. You've heard that, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, just and, mentioning Roy Haynes, I mean, Paul, my gosh, look at that guy's resume. Some of the names that this man has played with, some of the greatest musicians of the 20th century is just unbelievable. And he's like 95 and still playing. I yep. just saw him recently and he's still playing, yep. uh, which is incredible. But I wanted to ask you, of course, you know, we're uh, most of us are home because of the COVID-19. We're not touring, but any projects uh, that you're working on and some things that you have in mind? Are you composing anything right now? Oh, a lot. Yeah. I mean, um, I was supposed to go to Italy in, in April mm -hmm. because we, we have a new release. Uh, there's a bass player because I have a couple bands in Italy. There's one called it's our names. It's it's, um, it's the album is called Free the Opera. Mm -hmm. and there's a piano player, Fabrizio Mocata, Gianmarco Scalia, the bass player and myself. Mm -hmm. So Gianmarco and I have a quartet that we just did a great record on. It just came out wow. 
called Dynamics and Meditation. It's a quartet with a vibe player and a guitar player. They're Italian. And we went in and just played. I mean, you know, like I didn't read any charts. It was just, it was, it, and the engineer was uh, an engineer for ECM Records. So it sounds great. There's another record that that's, was supposed to come out, but now that we're not touring, we didn't do it. It's a double record with Gian Marco on bass, um, guitar player Romando Melalupe, who is actually a monarch in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. And then the sax player John Hellowell from Supertramp, because we have Super Tramp. So then, since the COVID thing, um, the Free the Opera Trio, we went in Rome about a year or two ago, just one night, just kind of played in the studio, just sight read some stuff, you know. And we didn't think anything of it. And then we rediscovered it. So it, it sounds great. So that's going to be coming out. Then projects, I mean, I'm doing so many records for different people. I just, I played in Russia with this great um, guitar player, Roman Marinchenko. And so he just sent me um, a track to play on. I'm playing on it next Monday um, with uh, Dominique DiPiazza, the bass player with John McLaughlin and stuff. I, I've got that happening. Um, free the, well, the band Word of Cocaine Gray, we're working on a new thing. There's a, a thing I found, man, I've been finding all these tracks going through my basement. I found a thing with my quintet with Lyle Mays that he said, mm. that's amazing. I found stuff, uh, me and Charles Gale and, and you know, the, the sax player, I don't know if you know Charles Gale was, and, and Harrison okay. Bankhead. I found a duo record with me and Gray, and Larry Gray that we did, so we're putting that out. I mean, there's just tons of projects, you know. Exciting. And it's just so exciting because when we go back to school, I, I'm, in fact, I'm writing all my syllabi because the syllabi drafts are due August 1st. It's going to be remote. And so, which is great because I love teaching via Zoom. I can pull up everything. Mm -hmm. I've got everything here in my house. I mean, right. you know, it's it's just something, you know, I miss the, the I guess, what the interaction with the people well, yeah, in person. But the interaction now is like this. This is, you know, kids are very visual now. Yeah. That's the difference. I mean, I, I think when Gutenberg's pr printing press came out, everybody thought it was the end of, uh, end of literature because they weren't writing him. Now they're going to do a press. You know, so now people think of the end of books, but now people learn in different ways. I mean, it's just, it, is it better? Is it worse? I don't know, but it's progress. Things progress. And so I think... You know, like, like even this, I mean, you know, like um, to be on Zoom, you know, I, I, I can think, okay, this is, this is, I don't know how to use Zoom, but I do, you know, I, I can change, you know, my backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can go on, you know, say like if I decided to put, you know, I've got this background here, but, you know, I love trains. So all of a sudden exactly. here's my background, you know? Well, you, see, you see what I do. I mean, I use a uh jazz uh, photos and art, j uh, album covers for my background to make it more interesting, you know? Right, here's, my, here's my book, you know, if I want to. You know. <laughs> That's great, man. So, yes, so I go on that. And, and, you know, if you want to talk about great uh, stories on the road, we can do that, because I'll, I'll put up a railroad thing here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I wow. Mean, That's cool, so, man. I, mean, I like that. That was the other thing, not just music, but, okay. So I'm into trains, always been into trains, okay? Mm -hmm. So... I've got I've gotten to drive trains, not only not only freight trains but passenger trains. One time I was with that band SBB for seven years after I left Pat. They were Polish, the most legendary Polish rock band. I played with them mm -hmm. for seven years. So one time on a day off, we went. I think it was Croatia at the time. We went to look at these monuments, you know, which was unbelievable. And I saw railroad tracks, and we were going to go back to the hotel. And I said, where are those railroad tracks going? They said, well, it goes back to the city we're in, you know, where our hotel is. And the train came in. So I went to my drum tech who was, could, he was, you know, he could speak that language. He was Polish, but he could speak the language. He, 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 you know, he asked if I could ride up front with the engineer. And at right. first the engineer, the engineer goes, no, 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 you know. And then he told him who I was and who I was playing with. So then the engineer goes, yeah, sure. So my drum tech and I go in the cab of this in engineer and we take off and I'm talking to the engineer through my trans, you know, translator. And after about 20 minutes, you know, he could tell I knew a lot about trains and he goes like, <laughs> I went, sure. And so I drove a passenger train through the mountains, making the stops and everything on, on that trip. 
Wow. Which is really crazy. Now, here's a really funny one. One time in L.A., uh, I had just gotten my hotel room in L.A., and the phone rang, and this really weird guy called me. He was like, a, like said he knew all these drummers and stuff, but I, I got a really bad vibe from this guy, you know? So I'm like, okay, fine, you know? So I happened to talk to Greg Bissonette, who this guy said he yeah. knew. And Greg said, oh, yeah, this guy's stay away. This guy's a drag, you know? So that night, backstage i'm by the crew bus just by the stage door and some guy comes up to me and starts talking to me and i'm like oh no and we start talking and it turns out it's not this guy it's just somebody someone else and you know, this guy was real interesting and he just happened to say at one point he said man you know the show's sold out do you have any like you know tickets any comps and i said well yeah i don't have any guests tonight so i gave him a cop and he goes well, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, well, we have a day off tomorrow. He goes, well, I'm an emergency flight instructor. So if you come out to Long Beach Airport, I'll take you up. So I go the next day, take a cab out to Long Beach. And the first thing he does, he teaches me, because I bungee jumped and parachuted down and stuff, but up to that time, I hadn't done this yet. So right. he teaches me how to, how to use a parachute in, in case the plane bends or he passes out. So we take off in this two-seater Robin, take off, and then he gives me the controls. I'd never flown a plane in my life. And so we get out over Long Beach. He, he says, keep on looking like, you know, because there's no radar on this plane. So you have to be careful for any other aircraft or anything. And so he says, keep your eyes on horizon. Now hit the rudder and throw it as hard left so I, I, to do a flip. So I start doing flips. I'm doing, I'm doing owl rounds. I'm doing stalls. I'm doing all this stuff. I had never done this before. And then we, we buzzed the, the tower on the way down and landed. And I've done this like a bunch of times with this guy. But mm -hmm. I mean, the next, the next day, Pat, I met, met Pat at the airport and he was so happy to see me because I, he was where I was going to get killed, you know. But we were doing all this crazy stuff because I'll do anything. I mean, I'm just like up for adventure, basically. <laughs> Man, that is so cool. You could actually write a book. Well, no, so I, experiences and what, what you've done. That's incredible, you know? A lot of people want me to write books. I mean, you know, I mean, it would be really funny because I have to be careful what I say about people, too, and what, what you know. But, I mean, it would be really, it would be an interest. I don't think people would believe half the things I've done, <laughs> you know? Boy, Paul, have you ever put out uh, an instructional tape video on drumming? I have. I, I've, I put out two. There was one called Fine Tuning Your Drumming, mm -hmm. which was only on VHS. It was actually from a clinic I did in Philadelphia back around like, you know, probably 86, I think. Okay. And so I put it to DVD, but it was never really widely available. And then I did another one called, it was called, I did it for a Japanese company it was called sound work of drumming that's so japanese you know where it features my quintet in the studio and then i talk about all the music and then um warner brothers bought it and put it out vhs right as dvds came out you know nice. so then um alfred music bought it so it, it's called now it's called um uh, Paul Wertico's drum philosophy. I'm really proud of it. It's really, I, mm. so that was done like, you know, in the early nineties. Um, and then my book, you know, the one I just put up there. Right. Let me, sh let me show everybody this one because I'm really proud of this too. Because again, you know, talking about not thinking like anybody else, this book turned the beat around uh, Alfred music, put it out in 2017. Now mm -hmm. it's the only book ever written about playing snare drum backbeats on one and three. I, I came up with the term front beats. Front so, beats. you know, cause everyone thinks it's gotta be on two and four. And you know, if people clap on the one and three, people laugh at people that clap on the one and three usually, because, mm -hmm. you know, theoretically, you know, you have the stronger beats, which are the one and three in classical music, especially, but then, you know, in African music, black music, you know, you have the backbeat. It's the call and response, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there were some tunes, you know, Sunshine of Your Love by Cream, uh, Bell Bottom Blues. Uh, that was uh, Eric Clapton, Do Derek and the Dominoes put that out with Jim Gordon. He played one and three on that. Uh, Woman Don't Want to Love Me by Dan uh, Chicago. Danny Serafin played that. Really great example is this great band called If that was a jazz rock band out of Britain. Um, the drummer 
uh, Dennis Elliott played one in three. There's a great video if you ever want to see. Look up if Forgotten Roads, Forgotten off, Roads of, if. off of Beat Club because the guitar player uh, is just like the most amazing guitar. He was like the number one guitar player in Britain at the time. But mm. the one in three changes everything. And then you have, you know, there's Afrobeat music like Tony Allen, who died recently, he would play on one and three. You have reggae music, you have, you know, certain ethnic music that has the one and three. But basically, I remember after the book came out, you know, my wife and I are sitting in like a Mexican restaurant, and they're playing like, you know, this Mexican pop, and everybody's playing on two and four. And you're going, why, why is this? Why does everybody do this? Right. So I started working I, this book, you can't finish because it goes from so simple to impossible. But what it does, and what it's done, done for my students, is that if you, instead of playing doom to the bottom, doom to the bottom, you go button to doom to the bottom to doom, you start concentrating on the one and three, which especially one is the grounding beat. So then when you play that, not only does it turn everything around? Because if you come out of a fill, instead of playing a crash with a bass drum, now you're playing a crash with the snare because you're coming back on the, on the front beat. Mm -hmm. and also, when you go and play back on two and four, you have so much more width to your time. All of a sudden, you're really aware of that grounding point. You know, because a lot of people talk about the two and four. They say, I'll put the metronome on two and four when you practice. You know, but it, even Dizzy Gillespie, there's a, a, a video where he's talking to like, a, um, I think it's a European... Uh, big band, he's talking about the one and three. Or you mm -hmm. talk to Henry Johnson, he's a great guitar player, plays, you know, with uh, Ramsey Lewis, Joe Williams, you know, Nancy Wilson, everybody. You know, he teaches the students. It, it's the one and three. It's the, and there's a Hal Galper video, too, where he's at the piano, and he's, he's, he's teaching his kid, you know, okay, if you tap on four, da, da, ba, da, da, ba, da, da, ba, da. Now you go, da, ba, ba, da, da, ba, da. If you just tap the, the, ha the, the half beats, you know, the half notes, your phrasing can breathe more than da, 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 you know? Right, right. And so stuff like that. So this book... I don't know how many people have bought it. I mean, it got great reviews, but you know, I think is it on I, Amazon. It's it's on it's on Amazon. It's everywhere. And you your know? website too. Okay. It's on my website, and you know, it took me about two years to put it out because a friend of mine, Michael Finkelstein, who used to be with Alfred, he wanted me to write a book. So I wanted to write a book about my approach to music. I mean, even the way we can even talk about my cymbal sound with you if you want. I can talk oh, about I'd love that. to, man. I love but, your cymbal work. Yeah. Yeah, but I talked to Dave Black, who is the, the guy in position there at Alfred. He goes, well, you know, we'd rather have something else. And I, all of a sudden I come up with the, the the, you know, backbeats on, on, on one and three idea. And I was really cautious. I almost told, I said, man, you have to promise me that you're not going to let anybody else know about this because I knew I didn't want someone to all of a sudden write a article for modern drummer and steal right. the idea. So I was so relieved because it took about two years to get this book finished. Yes. And, and then when it came out, it got, it got really good reviews, but like, again, um, it's just one book. I'm, I'm working on a polyrhythmic book. I've already programmed over 3,000 polyrhythms. Not only, not only read them out, but, but programmed them. You can, so you can hear like 35 over 17 and stuff, you know. But I don't know when I'm ever going to finish this book. I mean, it's just like an endless, because I'm 67, you know. And um, so, but just the adventure of just doing it and just learning these things. Yeah. Um, so before I forget, let, let's talk a little bit about the symbol technique. Yes. For a second. Okay. So one thing, I, you know, I can play any symbol. It doesn't matter if, if I've changed symbol companies now. I'm with Dream Symbols now. I used to be at Peisty. Mm -hmm. So, because I played other people's symbols, but it's the touch. It's where you hold the stick, how you hold the stick, but it's also your stroke. Because I remember doing a clinic one time in Germany and this guy, he came up, a student or whatever, and he, and he shows, he, he's going to play what I played on first circle. And he's playing on two cymbals, and it sounds like, it sounds like a military march. And I said, no, 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 you can't hit straight down. So if you hit straight down, you get one sound. Hit mm -hmm. to the right, the pitch goes up. Hit to the left, it goes down. Ah, okay. So I'm dancing. So I'm, in, 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 so I'm tap dancing. Like basically when I teach kids how to use brushes or anything, you look at all the old great jazz drummers and they're all tap dancing on the mm -hmm. stage. They're playing mm -hmm. like this. They're not playing like this. Now right. there's nothing wrong with playing straight down. If you want to sound, you know, so many people try to sound like drum machines, you know, they try to sound like, you know, like sequencers. 
if the music calls for it, you got to do what the music calls for. But if you really want to have, you know, a variety of sounds, that's why I can play on a small kit and get all these myriad of sounds because I'm using a myriad of touch. You know, mm. I'm not just striking the same way. Now, I remember when we were doing uh, Secret Story, there were some mm. other drummers on there. Steve Ferrone played, and, you know, he, he and I are friends. And I sat at his kit, and every drum head was like marked like this dead center. Like there were no stray strokes from the dead center stroke, which scared the hell out of me, you know? But that's how he gets that pitch. That's how he gets that sound in the studio. Right. Where you look at jazz drummers and it's marked all over the place because we're using different areas of the drums to get different timbres out of the drums, you mm -hmm. know? So that's, that's a bit, big thing. And, you know, my sticks, for instance, I have, you know, signature stick from Promark. I have uh, two products on Promark, the tubes, which are these plastic tubes that are great. And then my stick, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an 808. It's, it's got a bigger tip than a lot of uh, jazz sticks do. So I use different sticks when I play different gigs, depending on the volume or the sound I want. But the idea is to let the stick breathe like a clave. If you, if you hold the stick too tight, you know, you choke it off. That's okay for certain reasons too, you know, if you get a certain sound, but that's all the shot goes right up your arm, you yeah. know? <laughs> so if you, if you play loosely, the stick is the shock absorber. Now, the other thing, the way I play, since I played on pillows, there's no bounce on a pillow. So I came up with finger control, you know, not even actually, I just, I just had to get whatever I was getting out of this pillow to be able to play it like a tight drum. So I can go from the tightest drum to the loosest drum, but it's all in my hands, you know? I tell you, one of the things that I always loved, Paul, I loved watching you play. I'd be watching some of the Pat Metheny uh, group concerts, and I would just focus on you, and you would just be there with your eyes closed like you were just dreaming and playing. I said, look at Paul, you know, and uh, yeah, man, just... Uh, I don't even know what to say. It's just been a joy having you on the show today. Your wealth of knowledge. And I think people will really like this interview. But hang on. I'm about to close out the show. Oh, okay. We've heard it from Paul Wordico. And as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm uh -huh. Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace. <laughs>